for the Ricky sermon text is going to be 2 Timothy t- number 1, 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to pray that Brother Ricky's sermon would be very edifying, and I want to pray that you will give him strength to speak, and in Jesus' name, amen. Firm, but the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That's why Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel, because when he preached it and the gospel was mixed with faith, it always brought change. Because if men are going to be saved, they have got to be changed. They've got to be something different than what they are. And we know what that change is because he says, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So they're made right. And men that are made right live right. And that's because of the gospel. We expect as a result for the gospel to always be doing something. It's always doing something. There's always motion with the gospel. There's always progress with those that embrace the gospel. It always does something. That's the way the gospel is. I like Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish the thing in which I sent it to and prosper therein. See, so this is the way the gospel is. There's no, there's no chance that this gospel is powerless. It does something, see? And in our text, the gospel, this is what the gospel does. The gospel is a shining light. It shines upon the things that are unseen that would remain unseen unless the gospel shines on it. It makes known to us things that otherwise we would never know and understand. And you can't enter into something that you don't understand. And so the, it shines on those things so that we can understand them and so that we can know them. Now, we know of the importance of light. You know, one of the chief qualities of light is that it makes manifest. That's what it does. It's very important. But we understand the importance of the quality of light when we find ourselves in a situation where there's darkness. See? If you've ever tried to, to like negotiate the garage to the kitchen in the darkness, it can be a very difficult thing. You find yourself stumbling over things that are there because you can't see them. You need light to be able to see them. The light didn't create them, but the light made them known because when those things are made known, then you adjust the way in which you are negotiating because you can see those things, right? And this is what Jesus was talking about when he said, are there not 12 hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. And there are people today right now that are stumbling through life because they've not believed the gospel. And if you aren't stumbling through life, it's because you have believed the gospel. And because the gospel is making known things that are unseen so that we can adjust our conversation to those things. You know, one of the greatest examples of stumbling in the Bible is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The Bible says if they had known that he was the Lord of glory, they would not have crucified him. See, that was one of those unseen realities that the gospel has to unpack. And if they had known that, they would, they would never have laid a hand to Jesus if they had really known that he was the Lord of glory. But they didn't know that. And so they stumbled over the stumbling stone. And we are left to stumble unless we have light whereby we can see. And the gospel is in fact that light. Now what does that light shine on? Well, I like what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. He said, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. That's what we're talking about. It's not a light that primarily sheds on bad things. It's a light that primarily sheds on good things. The gospel is good news. That's what it is. It's good news. 
it shines upon the things that have to do with salvation, things that have to do with our glory, like the dying of Christ and the defeat of the devil and the sending of the Holy Spirit. See, things like this that are related to our salvation, those are things that are made known in the gospel, see? You know, we see the value of this kind of light when we come to the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. It's interesting that there were a number of people at that cross that were gazing at Jesus for hours and nobody had any idea what was going on. In fact, the Bible says they shall look on him whom they have pierced, but it didn't matter how long they looked. They didn't have any idea what was going on there. Not even John, not even Jesus' mother or his mother's sister. They didn't have any idea what was going on there. They could look to the bleeding Savior on the cross and not have any idea that the devil was being destroyed and that sins were being put away and that the old covenant was being shifted to the new covenant. They didn't have any idea that that was going on. Because I see, I have not seen nor ear heard the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Those are things that have to be revealed. And those things are revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We actually see this kind of thing pictured in the law. You know, the Day of Atonement was the highest day for the people of Israel because that was the day in which the sacrifice was made for atonement for the sins of the year. But isn't it interesting that this critical activity of making atonement that took place in the most holy place was not seen by anyone? Nobody saw it. This most critical thing of having sins put away, and yet nobody but one person saw what was going on. Now what the gospel does is it brings you within the curtain so that you can see the sins of the world being put away. You can see what's going on. That's what the gospel is. You can see Jesus dying. You can see the sin of the world being put away and the devil being overcome because you're not going to profit from the work of God unless you can see it with the eyes of faith. The gospel gives us the ability to see it. You know, that's what good preaching is. Good preaching gives you the ability to see the work of God in salvation. Huh? What's more important than that, right? Now, in our text, the thing that's being brought to light that is so important to see is life and immortality and the abolition of death. But before we can even get, excuse me, before we can even get to the what is taking place in salvation, we are first drawn to the who. Who hath abolished death? It's the who that's the critical point here. See, in the gospel, it's the who before the what. That's the critical point. It's the person of Jesus Christ that is the critical thing to be seen. You see, God is not accomplishing his work through impersonal means. The work of salvation is being accomplished through a who. It's through a person. The person of Jesus Christ himself. You know, as soon as men exalt something over someone, they're in danger of falling from grace. You know, as soon as the Galatians began to exalt circumcision over belief and faith in Christ, they were on the wrong road. Amen. And all false teaching does that. It all draws your attention away from the who of the gospel. That's the way it is, see? And so Paul told them, you're in danger because if you be circumcised and keep the law, you're going to be damned. You've fallen from the grace of God, see? We've got to see the who. All kingdom endeavors are brought to pass by a person. All of them. 
To obtain grace, you have to come to the throne of grace. And a king is the one who sits on that throne. If we stand, it's God who makes us stand. If we receive the things of Christ, the Spirit has given them to us. See, life in Christ has freed us from the law of sin and death. It's a person. We are made fruitful by our connection to the vine. If we are following the right path, Jesus has been shepherding us. It's always a who. Resisting in the evil day comes from standing strong in the Lord. You're made strong by your connection to the Lord himself. If we see light, it's because his presence is shedding light. We are encouraged because God is the God of comfort and we mount up with wings like eagles because he's the one who renews our strength. It's a person. If we stop proclaiming the person, people are going to be subject to putting their faith in something. And when they put their faith in something, they're going to go to hell. That's just the way it is. You don't add something to Jesus as a point of belief. Because the entire work is resting on the shoulders of a person. Isaiah said, a man. And that's what he meant. He didn't mean men. He meant a man. Man, a man, the person of Jesus Christ. He is the one that is doing in our text. You know, a godly life is simply the byproduct of a working God and a person trusting in that working God. See, that's the main thing. So when men want to give us a method, put the method aside and trust in the man. And then he'll produce in your life what's fruitful and, and what is satisfying to God. Now, <clears throat> what is this man doing? Or shall we better say, what has he done? Because that's what's announced. What has he done? What has this man done? The scripture says that he has abolished death. You know, in salvation, sin and death are the real enemies. Yeah. Right? They're the real enemies. To me, that's wonderful about the gospel. God sees death as an enemy. God sees sin as an enemy. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Oh, death, I will be thy plagues. Isn't that wonderful? I like to think about that. You think about the gospel. What's happening in the gospel? God's plaguing death. See, death has long enough plagued men. God says it's enough. In the gospel, my son is going to plague you because you've wreaked havoc over my creation and God plagues death. Kind of like God plagued, you know, when, when God plagued Pharaoh, man, the whole, the whole area of Egypt was destroyed. That's what God's doing. And that's what Jesus has done. See, what Jesus has done is by his death, he has plagued death. He has destroyed death through death, you know. This word, to abolish, that's a very good word. Sometimes I love to look at the definitions of word because the different def definitions can be like a, like a well. There's like good things in some of these definitions. You know, one of the definitions of abolish is to unemploy. Unemployed. I like that. You know, when David killed Goliath and took his own sword and took his head off, he unemployed him. Amen. That man, Goliath, was never a soldier again. Right? He was unemployed. He's unemployed. When Jesus died, he went after the head of the serpent and he bruised his head. He suffered a mortal wound. He destroyed him that had the power of death. If you're going to free men from death, you got to get to the root of the power of death. So that's exactly what Jesus did. He went after the great Goliath and took his head off. That's what he did. So he couldn't plague anybody. And he, and he killed him with his own sword. That's what he did. He killed him with his own sword. So Jesus, by death, has freed men from death. See, that's how he abolished it. See, he abolished it. Another word for abolish is to... I don't have it in here in my notes, but I, I was looking over this word the other day and I, and I thought, 
they made a connection between abolish and like the, uh, when you take a law that you no longer want to be active, you actually just depower the law. Okay, I don't remember the exact word for it, but that's what they do. They, they just neutralize the law so that the law no longer has any power, no longer has any effect. So it has, it has no effect upon men and they do things like this. And that's also what we see in abolish. Because when Jesus died, he made a way to give life that would neutralize the power of sin and death. Think about it this way. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, death was neutralized by life. It was neutralized by life. He came back from the dead and there was nothing that death could do to keep a hold on him. Now I know there was a physical sense in that because he was going to have to die again, but think about this text. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. See, death has been abolished by death, but death has also been abolished by life. It's like two things in one here. By a, here's how he has abolished death is by bringing life. See, and that's what he's done for us. He's brought us life, see, a different kind of life. You know, spiritual life is a different kind of life. It's not an improvement in a earthly life. It's a totally different kind of life altogether. It's a life that's not mingled with death. Spiritual life is not a life that's mingled with death. See, on the earth, you have life mingled with death. And so as long as you're living, you're having to struggle with the different effects of death. For example, the outer man is perishing. As long as you're tied to this body, you have life and death mingled together. And so you have to deal with that. You have to deal with that. There is nothing, there is no death in the life which he has given to us. There isn't. You say, but yet I experience death. But the experience of that doesn't come from the life he's given. Now think about this just from a general way. For example, the scripture says this, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. So well, let, let's, let's take the text before us and let's translate that. Here's the blessing of the Lord, that God gives to us eternal life and death is not added to it. Amen. It's not added to it. You are in a very real first fruit sense tasting of immortality. Amen. What is immortality? It's life without death. That's what it is. It's not just length of days. It's the quality of that life. It's a life that doesn't have any death attached to it. You know, the saints of God, the saints of God struggle still with the reality of death in different ways. It may not be part of eternal life, but we still have it, okay? For example, the fact that we groan is an evidence that there's still death about us. It's not connected with the life you have, but it's still about us. And so we groan. In fact, the more you grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ, the more that you will have an aversion to death. That's an evidence of new life. That's an evidence of new life. Dead people are not, dead people do not have an aversion to death. It's living people that have an aversion to death, see? And so that's one of the evidence. We have to deal with that. How about this one? Paul talked about temptation in Romans 7. And then at the end of that, after he had said, when I will to do good, evil is present with me. You, you remember what he said. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? We face temptation because there's death. There's death about us, see? And so we have to deal with that. Another aspect of death, say like I, <clears throat> I talked to one of the sisters here before we started here, Sister Karen actually. Sometimes we have to pray for a brother because he's sinning. What are we asking for? Life. Death setting in on him, doesn't that have an effect on us? When you see death setting in on somebody, doesn't it have an effect on you? Yeah, it does. You see people retrogressing. It has an effect on you. It's a burden to us. It's a burden to us. And there are other ways that we could talk about death. The the wicked man, the fact that you have to deal with the wicked man is you're having to deal with the effects of death. 
But here's what immortality has to do with. And since we're just, we're just like in the first fruit stages of this life that we have been given. But immortality simply means this. You will never again have to deal with the effects of death ever again. That's a marvelous reality, and that's a truth that we're, that we're all going to realize. That good preaching will do that, brother, and it will encourage us to hope beyond life in this world. We are being fitted for a place where there shall be death no more. See? And that's a wonderful thing. But I just want to encourage you with this when it comes to this life that we already have. That the life you have now from God is not mingled with death, although you experience death. And there are a lot of ways in which we could highlight this in the scriptures. <clears throat> For example, how about this one? The scripture says that Jesus was manifested to destroy the devil. And then he goes on to say this. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now, how about that reality? See, he, he cannot sin. I think people stumble over that. He cannot sin. He doesn't have that capacity to do that. In fact, the only way that a believer can sin is by walking in the flesh. Because there isn't death mingled with the new life that you have received. The truth of the matter is, if, if death and life were mingled together, death would corrupt that life. The fact that you have a sustained godly affection is evidence that there's a separation between the life you have received and the death that is still about us. Okay? And so I'll tell you, I, I'm so thankful for these marvelous announcements of what Jesus has done. This is, this is a great blessing for us. Here is something that men do not like to talk about. They don't like to talk about death. And I've, I've thought about this last Sunday, but it's true. The main reason why is because it's something they don't have any control over at all. Men do not have power in the day of their death. They don't have control over it. So they don't like to think about it. They like to put it out of their mind or kind of pretend that they have some kind of control over it, make their days longer and things like this. But when it comes down to it, men do not have control over death. But Jesus has absolute control Amen. over death. Amen. And he proved it when he died by abolishing death. And he's continuing to prove it when he, when he gave us life, when we were joined to him and he gave us life. And that life is now being sustained. He's proving that he has power over it. Power over death and power to give life. And I'll tell you this, he has power to take you from where you're at, although we are still surrounded by death and to bring you to a place where death shall not be. And that will be immortality, see? And the words of the apostle I think are fitting, and I'm just gonna close with these words. Forgive me for the shortness of this, but I'm just, I'm just telling you what I can see and nothing more. But 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57 is a, it a fitting, fitting conclusion to these considerations. When, the, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and that is gonna happen. That is going to happen. And this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? Oh, I love to think about God. Ribbon death, chanting against death. O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you.